Hello, everybody. If you're new to our webinar series, welcome and thank you for joining us. Criterion Edge runs multiple and formative webinars throughout the year. Today's webinar topic is CER Critical Concepts. Effectively telling the story of the CER, focus on S&P objectives, acceptance criteria, clinical benefits, and risk benefit analysis. We're proud to announce that Criterion Edge has been awarded Company of the Year among top regulatory services companies. So how can we help you? If you'd like to speak with us about your upcoming projects or regulatory writing needs, we would be happy to book an appointment with you. You can email us for a free 30-minute consultation at consult at criterionedge.com. Our presenter today is Lori Mitchell, founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing firm serving the medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety and pharmacovigilance management, and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory and medical writing solutions to many pharma and medical device companies, both large and small, she is a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is also a published author and holds a Master of Nursing from UCLA. And now I will go ahead and welcome Lori to give an overview of our session today. Hi, Lori. Hi, Olivia, thank you. And welcome everyone to this um, webinar. We've got a big crowd here today, which tells me that um, this, there's, this resonates, this topic resonates with all of you. So I hope I can do it justice. Uh, let's get started. So this session today is presented from the point of view of us. Our, we are seasoned MDR compliant CER medical writers. Uh, we'll outline the key foundational concepts of the CER as it relates to this particular topic today and how to effectively identify, present, and analyze these parameters and concepts within the context of an MDR compliant CER. So we like to take a practical approach to our webinars. Uh, we're all in the problem solving business, uh, you, us. So let's talk about how we can practically approach this. Let's define each of the concepts that we're about to talk about. I'll do that and their relationship to each other. This is a very relational webinar today. Uh, so, so hang on to watch that we'll talk about one concept and how it relates to the next and the next and the next. So we'll develop some MDR um, aligned safety and performance objectives. And we will discuss how clinical outcomes are leveraged in the CER, clinical outcomes are leveraged in the CER and how they are different from S&P objectives, safety and performance objectives. And then tying it all together in the risk benefit section of the CER. And I did give you a hint that this is where it all comes together, but I will give you a heads up. Um, this would have been a two hour long webinar if I had really dug in deep to the risk benefit analysis section. I know I looked at some of your registration questions and there are several that, uh, that want to know specifically a lot of detail about the risk benefits section of the CER. I will give you all a heads up that I'm developing that webinar where we're talking only about the risk benefit uh, analysis because it's such a complex section. So you'll hear about it today, but we won't go into maybe the kind of detail that you are hoping for in this particular webinar. But let's get started. So we're going to start with those relationships and we're gonna start with the basics. That's where we are right now. Intended purpose indication for use. I mean, who doesn't know that? But let's ground ourselves in that. The intended purpose in article 212 it the intended purpose, intended use describes the intended effect of the device. All devices have an intended purpose or an intended use. So an example, you're gonna hear me do a lot of coronary artery stent examples today. So apologies if that's not your particular therapeutic area, but um, I thought I'd pick a therapeutic area and sort of stick with it. So an example intended purpose statement 
for a typical coronary artery drug eluting stent, it's very straightforward. Improve coronary artery luminal diameter. It does not need to be more complicated than that. That's your intended purpose. So how's an intended purpose different from the indication for use? All devices have an intended purpose, but not all devices have indications. I'm sorry, I said intended, indications for use. Not all devices have indications. Uh, sterilization um, devices leap to mind. But for most devices, the indications for use, those refer to the clinical condition that is diagnosed, prevented, monitored, treatment, treated, alleviated, compensated for, replaced, modified, or controlled by the medical device. That's a big, wide-ranging statement. So an example indicated indication for use statement. This I'm going to give a lot of examples today. Device X is indicated for improving coronary artery luminal diameter in patients with Systematic, symptomatic ischemic heart disease due to, to, to de novo native coronary artery lesion. That's a mouthful. There's a lot to unpack in there, but it's very specific. So we're starting from the foundations because we're going to, because the foundations matter when we get to the safety and performance objectives and the acceptance criteria. So a lot of you are charged with writing these types of statements in your IFU, for example, and in other many other documents in your um, company. So it matters how you begin. So the indication for use is the clinical condition. M make, it, make it very specific. Device X indicated for improving coronary artery luminal di diameter in patients with X, symptomatic ischemic heart disease due to de novo, it is very specific in these types of patients, in these types of uh, situations. So the indication for use is very specific. So the key takeaway here, confirmation of conformity with rele relevant GSPRs must include clinical data relating to all of the device indications. That's one reason to, to choose your words carefully in the indication for use statements, because whatever you say that are your device's indications, ultimately you are going to have to establish um, safety and performance using um, clinical data for each one of those aspects. So next, next slide. Intended clinical benefits. So, you know, article, uh, MDR article 253 defines a clinical benefit as the positive impact of a device on the health of an individual or a positive impact on the patient's management. So, and this is expressed in terms, this is again clinical benefit, expressed in terms of meaningful, measurable, patient relevant clinical outcomes. Now we've introduced a new term. So this is where we're gonna begin the linkages. We've talked about intended purpose, we're moving to clinical benefits and we're introducing the next term, which is clinical outcomes. Measurable patient relevant clinical outcomes, including outcomes related to diagnosis. That's straight out of uh, article 253. So clinical benefits are most definitely framed within the state-of-the-art landscape for the device and its competitors. What does that mean? That means that you identify cl your clinical benefits from your state-of-the-art landscape. You don't make them up. They have to be framed and, and recognized within the, the um, state-of-the-art landscape. So the, so the state-of-the-art section of the CER. Manufacturer must demonstrate that the device achieves its intended purpose, safety, its intended purpose and safety. Sorry, I've got safely. I'm sorry. I'm not even reading my own notes. Achieves its intended purpose safely and that there is a meaningful, quantifiable benefit to using it. These are all about benefits now. The clinical evaluation plan, and you're going to hear me talk a lot about the plan today. So please keep that in mind. 
most of this information that we're talking about today originates in the plan, not in the CER. So the clinical evaluation plan must include a detailed description of these intended clinical benefits to patients. And the plan must also include relevant and specific clinical outcome parameters. So again, here we go with outcomes. Let's, we're gonna talk about those in a minute. And the clinical evaluation must analyze all relevant clinical data in order to reach conclusions about the safety and clinical performance, including the device's clinical benefits. So benefits are very important. Um, and this gets into comments like, uh, uh, like uh, claims and so forth, but we'll talk a little bit about claims in a little bit. So the clinical evaluation plan introduces the concept of clinical benefits. It introduces the concept of uh, clinical outcomes. Now, what are all these things have to do with the next slide? We'll talk more about, uh, are we, did you move the next slide? Sorry, there we go. Clinical benefits, clinical outcomes. All right. Okay, let's do some samples. This is real world here. These are sample be uh, clinical benefits and sample uh, clinical outcomes. Let's start with the key takeaway down here at the bottom. I think that'll set up the slide. Clinical outcomes are specific, patient-focused or clinically-focused outcomes derived from the clinical benefits. Let's full stop on that one. Clinical outcomes come from the clinical benefits that you have identified, that have been identified in the state of the art. Think of clinical benefits as a direct precursor to clinical outcomes and as clinical outcomes as a direct precursor to safety and performance objectives. And that's where we begin our thread today. So our, here are some examples. Clinical, uh, clinical benefit is PCI with DES and cabbage is associated with better survival than medical therapy alone. That was a clinical benefit that was identified in the state of the art review. Okay, we have to get to a spot where we can take these clinical benefits and quantify them and establish whether they are true or not, essentially. The first step of that is to um, identify clinical outcomes associated with each clinical benefit. So PCI with DES and cabbage is associated with better survival than medical therapy alone. That's a clinical benefit, but we have to get to the spot where we're measuring this. So the first step is to convert that clinical benefit to a relevant clinical outcome. And an outcome would be improved outcomes with revascularization versus medical treatment. Again, this comes out of the state of the art. And that, that while that sounds obvious, um, medical treatment versus revascularization, well, of course, they're going to be improved outcomes. But you have to state that out loud, that there are going to be improved outcomes with revascularization versus medical treatment. In a minute, we're going to figure out how we prove that. But for now, we're making the linkage between the um, benefit that we found in the state of the art review with a clinical outcome relevant to the patient. Here's another example of the clinical benefit of DES, PCI with DES in the state of the art seems to result in a lower risk of myocardial infarction. That's a clinical benefit. How do you measure that? you start by identifying the outcome, improved outcomes with DES versus other PCI devices. That's an outcome. So let's move on to the next slide and start linking outcomes with safety and performance objectives and acceptance criteria. I will give a shout out to my friend, Yiting out there and Lori who, um, You'll notice that I'm using a phrase here that you two, we just talked about a couple of weeks ago. So what is an indicative list? Annex 14, section 1A uses that term. 
specifies that in the clinical evaluation plan, there must be included an indicative list and specifications of parameters to be used to determine, based on the state of the art, the acceptability of the benefit risk ratio for the various indications and for the intended purpose or purposes of the device. Okay, another big mouthful of a statement. So this is in the plan, I want to point out, that the plan, this Annex 14, Section 1A, is telling us that the plan itself should have this indicative list and the specification of parameters based on the state of the art in medicine. All right, so the indicative list, we interpret at Criterion Edge to mean the safety and performance objectives for your device. Specifications of parameters is must most definitely be the acceptance criteria. And the most important statement of all is that all of this is based on the state of the art in medicine. So I'll let that sink in a little bit too. We interpret that to be, and many of our clients do, and this has been for about the last eight months, maybe even up to a year, where the CEP, the plan, now includes a fully written state-of-the-art section. Fully written, just like it exists in the CER. Not just some statements about the, um, about the plan, but the, I mean, you know, about the SOA, but the actual SOA itself. So that's a big statement that I'm making. I'll let you think about that a little bit more. And yes, that means that when you're creating your CEP, you are writing the full-fledged state-of-the-art section for the CER. We write those two documents for our clients in parallel with each other, which means that the information we're putting in the CEP is not old. In other words, don't write your CEP six months before your CER is ready. Those two documents to many of our clients and to us are bolted together. When you update one, you update the other. Uh, so the, that means that when you're writing a state-of-the-art section in, for the CER and for the CEP, you are doing literature searches and you are identifying uh, safety and performance objectives from competitor device searches. And you're, you're identifying safety and performance objectives from your SOTA search, which has more to do with professional guidelines and standards and other meta-analyses where certain endpoints, safety and performance objectives, are identified. Two searches, state-of-the-art, the SOTA standards and uh, guidelines, and the competitor device search. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Let me just see, consider including the fully written state-of-the-art analysis in the CEP. And as I just stated, that is becoming more and more apparent that that is expected based on Annex 14's guidelines. Next uh, slide. So let's start with the safety and performance objectives. What are they and what is their purpose? Their specific safety and performance objectives are really specific clinical outcomes. Here we are with a linkage. We just talked about outcomes, but now safety and performance objectives are specific outcomes. They're measurable that are chosen to support safety and performance of the subject device. S&P objectives must be clinical, measurable, quantifiable with clinical data, with clinical data. Safety and performance objectives should be specific for each device indication. There should be multiple safety and performance objectives for each device indication, and all device indications must have safety and performance objectives. So examples of SPOs, rate of death, bleeding, procedural complications, or performance, rate of procedural success, device success, 
or a desirable or expected clinical outcome that's measured by a validated scale or score. Those are examples of safety and performance objectives that are specific. So next slide. All right, what are acceptance criteria? Many questions about what acceptance criteria are. So let's, let's dig through it. They perform a very critical function within the CER because they establish the measure, the bar by which your subject device data on those safety and performance objectives will be compared against. Acceptance criteria are actual data results, actual data results found in competitor device published literature, meta-analyses identified in the SOA search. Acceptance criteria are not calculated by you. They're not determined by you. They are extracted from competitor device published literature and these meta-analyses relevant to the specific safety and performance objectives. So we'll, there's a table coming up that puts all this together that I think will clear a lot of this up. Each safety and performance objective does indeed have its own set of acceptance criteria. These, these critical data points, they're extracted from these multiple sources. So since they're, they're extracted from multiple sources, the S&P objective table with the acceptance criteria included, you'll see in that column that it's a range of values. We'll see that in a minute. It's a range of values from high to low. You're gonna be basically, you maybe you found 25 references from your competitors and a few um, measurable um, meta-analyses. You're going to be entering, those are rows in this table, you know, Smith et al., Jones et al., all of those, those particular resources have data that you need to extract. So your table is going to be lo likely large, and it's going to include all the extracted safety and performance data in um, from an acceptance criteria from each one of those um, each one of those references, which can create a, a range. So then you we'll get to how you handle that range in a minute. So to summarize, by comparing the subject device data against the acceptance criteria derived from the state-of-the-art competitor data and data identified in the professional gui guidelines, you can now quantitatively demonstrate that the sub your subject device performs at the level of or better than its comparable competitor state-of-the-art devices. What does that mean? You are now establishing your technology, your device, within the state-of-the-art landscape. That's, you, you see that buzz phrase all the time, that your device must be established within the state-of-the-art landscape. This is how you do it. You've done your state-of-the-art searches, your competitor device searches, which use the same technology as your device. You are pulling their performance and their safety data, and you're about to now compare those data landmarks against your own subject devices data. That's the short answer to all that. So let's get into common questions related to the acceptance criteria. So this is a very common question. I only really gave one. This is very, 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 very common. If acceptance criteria rates are a range of individual results for each S&P objective, how do you choose a single rate to compare the results of your subject device data? All right, so here it is. This is how you do it. Um, you obviously can't, you're gonna have a big range. It could be, you know, 0.8% to 3.6%, you know, is the cumulative range from all of your competitor device sources. Okay, well, which number? Is it 0.6 or is it 3.8? 
for safety objectives. The results from each subject device data set, your subject device data sets, each one of them must fall at or below the higher bound. For example, competitive device and SOA literature identified death rates ranging from four to 8%. The acceptance criteria for your subject device is therefore less than or equal to 8% for that uh, particular um, objective. At or below the higher bound of the range. And then the opposite for performance is must be equal or exceed the lower bound. And there's the example right there. So, one caveat in blue down there, you must be using the same scale as the data that you're, or, or definition that you're pulling from your competitor device. I'll use a bleeding um, scale. For example, there's VARC, V-A-R-C, there's BARC, B-A-R-C-2. There's different scales. If you're using in your subject device data, BARC2 scale, then only pull BARC2 data. VARC or other scales do not, are, are not relevant. So that's the caveat there. Okay, let's go on to the table to tie it all together. I hope this makes a little more sense. All right, let's, let's start from the beginning. We talked about clinical benefits and I'm giving an example that we gave earlier. PCI with new generation DES and cabbage is associated with better survival than medical therapy alone. Where do those, did, did that statement come from or how was it derived from the state of the art section and analysis? In your analysis of the state of the art, you determined multiple clin clinical benefits and risks for that matter, but multiple clin clinical benefits. That's where that comes from. You do not make that up. It comes from the state of the art section and the landscape analysis. Great. Possible clinical outcomes related to the clinical benefit. Well, there are possible ones. There's lots. Rates of cardiac death could be rates of myocardial infarction. You're, you're going to have several for you all to consider within your teams, your clinical teams. Well, what's the best way to measure and the way we do it within our own company? How do we measure survival for our DES? Well, cardiac death, let's just, periprocedural cardiac death is a common one. However, you measure it because there will be multiple ways that you could measure it, but it must match your data. Periproc, cardiac death, fine. You chose that, that uh, safety and performance objective specifically to support that clinical benefit. You chose that safety and performance objective specifically for that clinical benefit. And your acceptance criteria then came in a range of actual rates from periprocedural cardiac death from competitor literature from low to high. It ranged from 2.1 to 4.5 based on our last slide. The final rate used in the analysis of subject device safety data, periproc cardiac death, your data your subject device data for this outcome, periprocedural cardiac death, your, your uh, uh, rates must be at or below 4.5%. There will be probably questions about what if it isn't below 4.5%. That is the obvious question here what do we do if it's if our data are do not measure up to that? Well, this is where the art of of you know CER writing comes in. You may be able to craft a justification as to why it doesn't. Will the notified body accept that your justification? Possibly, possibly not. Um, so that's a risk. That's always a risk is that your data may not measure up to the state of the art and the competitive landscape. And that is a fundamental issue within a CER. Okay.
Next question. We're almost done with our presentation. Just have a few slides to go. So I, I forewarned you earlier that I don't have a lot of uh, information on the risk benefit profile. I will say a few um, opinions that we have at Criterion Edge. When using our template, which we most commonly do, the two most important sections of a CER template, hands down, is the state of the art section at the beginning and the risk benefit analysis at the end. So my hint earlier was this is where it all comes home to roost is true. In the risk benefit section, all, all parts of the previous analyses need to come together to establish that your device is safe and, forms as, and performs as intended um, within, uh, within the boundaries of its IFU and intended purpose and intended indications for use. So where do you start in a risk benefit analysis? This is kind of a poor warning of an, another CER, uh, another webinar that I'm gonna do. So we'll, we have to talk about the clinical benefits, the benefit part of the risk benefit section. So clinical benefits encompass claims about any claim, manufacturer or otherwise, about clinical safety and performance outcomes. That's why I wanted to talk about claims and benefits earlier. And I know this is a really dense webinar today. I hope that you all download it, look at it, you know, the slides and kind of ponder it a little bit and what it means for you. Clinical benefits encompass claims about the safety and performance outcomes and include the ability of a subject device to achieve its intended use as it's claimed, as claimed. That's your clinical benefit assessment. You have to walk through that very methodically. More on that later about how you do that. Risk and safety analysis. The overall risk and safety analysis document in the CER is comprised of the clinical benefit assessment, which we just talked about separately above. Then the risks identified from the clinical data, an assessment of the risks. Now this is getting into your own risk management team and the risks that are now new, maybe perhaps newly identified or rates of risks that are newly changed within this clinical evaluation process. So remember the CER is a report of a process, which is the evaluation of your device. So it, when you evaluate the safety and performance of your device, it culminates, that evaluation culminates in a report called the CER. So maybe there were new risks identified from the, um, from the clinical evaluation and from the clinical data. As we, I think most of us all know, anything new that is identified, new rates, new occurrences that are identified in the CER process, those that new information must, there must be a loop back, back into your own company's clinical, um, um, out, your risk management, your risk benefit ratios and your risk management. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, side effects, acceptability. There will always be side effects of any device. Side effects are somewhat different than risks. They're, they're not necessarily risks. So you have to do a separate analysis of the side effect identification and the acceptability interpreted in the light of currently available alternative treatments. So, you know, you, you have a heart attack and you have chest pain and you have a, 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 a cardiac lesion in your coronary artery. You could want one alternative treatment is to watch and wait or take aspirin, right? Pharmacologic. Another one is to, is is more invasive. So that's what they mean about interpreted in the light of currently available alternative treatments, and then the acceptability of the side effects of those treatments. So this has been a lot. 
let's move on. I think we're just about there. Risk benefits section is where it all comes together. It's critical that you make declarative conclusion statements. Why is that critical? Because the notified bodies, as I always like to say, maybe a little snarkily or with love in my heart, that they are tired, they're sleepy, they're hungry, they don't, they're not getting any rest, and they're likely a bit cranky. So make declarative statements, make it a, a little easy on them to find, to say something like the statement at the bottom. All risks were evaluated as acceptable, and it is concluded that the benefits of the subject device continue to outweigh the associated risks. I can't emphasize enough the, the power of declarative statements. Sometimes we highlight them in bold, sometimes we put them in a little box, um, but we make them because it allows us all to be on the same page. Other things that you should stay, say in here, the post-market clinical data substantiates your own PMS data, that's manufacturer held data, substantiates safety and performance with low complaint rates and no new safety concerns observed. Another declarative statement. The risk benefits section is the place for declarative statements. And thus a review of the clinical data shows no new or emerging risks that have been identified through this clinical evaluation. There we are. Um, that is it. For us, we have some time for questions. I'll do my best to answer your questions and see um, if I can help. And now let's get started with our first question. Our first question today, Lori, comes from Yiting. And they're asking, please clarify the indicative list and specification of parameters to determine the acceptability of the benefit risk ratio. So eating, I hope that I did um, clarify that and what the indicative list is and how, where, from whence it comes, what, what, what is it exactly? An indicative list, meaning basically the safety and performance objectives, which are indicating the statements, which are indicating those objectives. And then finally moving all the way through to determining the um, acceptability of the risk benefit ratio when you are in the uh, in the risk benefit section thus then establishing your device is, is safe and performs as intended under MDR standards so i i wanted to put this up here because eating i know that you know you and i actually talked about this a couple of weeks ago and I wanted to, but I thought it was a great question for the rest of the attendees about this indicative list and how that relates directly back to um, uh, MDCG. All right, thanks, Lori. Let's get to our next question from Greta. Greta would like to know how to best conclude the CER with enough information so the notified body knows it's all there. Our conclusion sections haven't been enough. Um, well, I'll I'll reference those declarative statements first of all, but your but that's but that isn't really what's at the heart, I think, Greta, of your question, which is, um, you can only make declarative statements if you've actually done the work. And I think when you say that our conclusion sections haven't been enough, um, I can I I think we can all relate to that. The precision at which you must go through uh, the risk benefit analysis in particular, but even all conclusion statements as you move through the CER, beginning in the state of the art section, moving through conclusion statements that you're making about your own subject device data, conclusions that you're making about your PMS data, other data sources, Everywhere along the way, you're making declarative conclusion statements. This is the thread 
that moves through the CER, one of the many threads that moves through the CER is every step of the way, conclude, make definitive statements, address any issues that may come up uh, along the way so that you can move to the end of the CER, which should be the risk benefit analysis. So that in there, there's many more conclusion statements, definitive conclusion statements you need to make before you make the ultimate conclusion statements. Are the device is therefore determined to be safe and performs as intended um, based upon this, this whole evaluation. In, in our opinion, the conclusion section that comes after the risk benefit analysis is really is a summary. The conclusion story lands in the risk benefit analysis section. The conclusion section of the CER just sort of summarizes everything. So how to best conclude the CER with enough info so that the notified body knows that it's all there? Well, make sure there is enough info that you are reaching every, every hurdle. You know, do you have your clinical outcomes identified? Have you thus identified your safety and performance objectives for every indication, every population, every anatomic location? Do you have safety and performance objectives for each one of those? And then leaping over into data, the, and then did you identify your acceptance criteria for those SPOs? And then leaping, leaking, leaping over into data, point by point by point, data set by data set, you have to make conclusions along the way. So I would say, don't wait to the end, make sub conclusions along the way, and then wrap it all up in the risk benefits section, and then basically summarize it in the conclusion section. All right, thanks, Lori. Let's get to our next question from Lauren. Should acceptance criteria be defined in the clinical evaluation plan, or can these be defined after the literature search? So we addressed that, but um, this is a great question uh, because we did address that. Acceptance criteria should be defined in the plan, um, which means that you need to do a full state-of-the-art review and assessment and literature searches in order to establish those acceptance criteria. So, so that part of the sentence the question is correct. But the or part, or can these be defined, acceptance criteria defined after the literature search? So acceptance criteria are defined from competitive device uh, literature searches and that are methodologically screened, reviewed, and extracted for uh, relevant data. So that's the uh, uh, competitor device. And then I also mentioned in the SOA section that we also do the meta-analyses basically from guidelines and background information. Those also contain um, safety and performance objectives and clinical standards, if you will. So those can go into the mix as well. So that's the plan, is that you would define these acceptance criteria in the plan, but that gets back to my one of my first points is that now we're starting to do the whole state-of-the-art section in the plan. So that's, that's that, Olivia. Next question. All right. Our next question comes from Amen. And they are asking, in order to establish a complete CER, is the MDCG 2020-13 CER suggested template enough? Well, I, you know, at the risk of, you know, at the risk of sounding negative, it a template it is a template, and it can be very high level. It can be extremely granular with lots of work instructions in it and lots of problem solving um, hints. So the MDCG CER is is not a grand, a particularly granular. Uh, suggested a, a template. So I would say it's a start, but it will not answer lots and lots and lots of questions for you. You know, the, the, as 
Some people say the devil is in the details. And the MDCG contains high level details at best, not details about how to solve your own uh, issues with your own device and how to approach shortcomings or the best way to um, uh, display your data or present your safety and performance objectives. It, it doesn't help you at that level. So that's my, it's a good place to start, but you'll have a long way to go even after that. All right, moving on to our next question. If the acceptance criteria exceeds the limits for safety and performance, do we have to give justification and, and tell that the acceptance criteria was met? Oh, I answered this question, yeah, earlier. And um, yes, if the acceptance criteria does not fall within the limits for each safety and performance objective, each safety and performance objective data that falls outside of that, the acceptance criteria, th there must be a justification presented. And the, the, that's a very, I said earlier, that's a very artful and sometimes impossible task because at the end of the day, the data are the data. And if it's possible that there may be some extenuating circumstances that you could write about, um, it's possible that there won't be, and that that you will have some um, some of your data falling outside of acceptance criteria, which is a risk, and it's a serious risk. We have helped many a client work on those regulatory responses for from a notified body review round one, because they will see it, and if you if they don't accept your justification, you will be hit with a question about that every time. Okay. Question. These two questions were sort of similar, so I put them together here for you. The first one, should the risk benefit analysis contain a quantifiable benefit risk ratio? And how can the risk benefit relation be quantified? So the key word here is quantifiable ratio, two, two key words there. Um, this is how we approach it at Criterion Edge for all of our clients. And it is never has never been questioned. So, and so this is an opinion, you can take it for what it's worth and based on our experience. It is unfortunate in my opinion that MDCG and other you know, guidance documents and regulations actually use the term benefit risk ratio. I, I cannot count how many times I have answered questions like this from potential clients. How do we calculate the ratio? You don't, it's not a calculation. It's an assessment, it's words, it's an analysis. It's conclusion, it's an assessment. It's not a this divided by that equals something else. So as hard as that may be for some people to accept, we, we do not calculate, there is no such thing in our world as an actual mathematical ratio. What we interpret the word ratio to mean is the pluses and minuses. It's almost like a, you know, like a seesaw, which is, are the, do the risks outweigh the benefits or do the benefits outweigh the risks, which is of course the way you want it. And uh, so that in a sense is sort of a relationship, isn't it? Which I guess could be in some people, you know, could say, well, that's sort of a ratio, but it's an assessment, it's not a number. So you do not need to quantify anything. Do you need to explain it? Yes, very, very methodically, yes. Do you need to present data that uh, support your assessments and ultimate conclusions? That's the quantitative part of it, is that you have quantitative risk data. Uh, it, your entire CER is full of data. You summarize all of that basically in the risk benefits section. So there's your data. But think of the ratio not as a numerical value or a calculation, 
but as a as a uh, benefits outweighing the risks from an argument standpoint using the data that you you have gathered throughout this clinical evaluation process that is reported in the report when you're making this conclusion at the end. So I hope that helps. I know that many people probably have the same question. You may be doubting me because of the word ratio. I get it. But we've probably written by this time 200 MDR CERs. This question never comes up. We the way we present it as a as an argument, not as at the end of the day. The benefit we make argument statements, not show them calculations. Good questions. Thanks everybody for that. Okay. Janelle is looking for some information on outcome parameters associated with clinical benefits. What can you say about this, Lori? Well, we did talk about those outcome parameters earlier. And if we kind of go back to that, thinking about the um, table that's in the uh, webinar, and I hope you all can download the webinar uh, uh, to just kind of mull over it yourself and, and kind of re-listen to some of these comments is that the remembering that, again, the clinical benefits are derived from your analysis of the state of the art. I want to reemphasize that. They're derived from the analysis of the state of the art. You do not create them yourself. Can you go to the state of the art uh, when you're doing your state of the art search? Can you come kind of forearmed with what you think your benefits and your safety and performance objectives will be? Yes but you can't put in a, a, a clinical benefit in your CER that isn't supported by your state-of-the-art analysis, which means in your state-of-the-art section, you have to call out those benefits as, and then look for outcomes associated with those clinical benefits. So the outcomes would be more like now we're in data. And the example I gave in the table was a clinical benefit quote, PCI with new generation DES and cabbage is associated with better survival than medical therapy alone. That's a conclusionary statement that we put in our um, state of the art section based upon the state of the art landscape analysis. So it is associated with better survival rates. Okay, what's the outcome related to that clinical benefit? rates of cardiac death or myocardial infarction, whatever you choose as a manufacturer to support associated with better survival. So that is the, that is the linkage between your, the clinical benefits that you identify in the state of the art and with ultimately the outcomes that are going to absolutely queue up the very next step after the outcome is safety and performance objectives. So what would you use for safety and performance objective to support that clinical outcome, rate of death or myocardial infarction? Okay, let's choose a very specific one, periprocedural cardiac death, which is a very specific um, safety and performance objective that's very measurable. So that's the linkage. Go back and kind of ponder the the getting from clinical benefits identified in this in the SOA all the way to your safety and performance and acceptance criteria. That's that whole process that happens in the state of the art section. I'm sorry, we've only got time for maybe a couple more questions. We had a huge uh, turnout today, honestly. I see the questions just queued up. To, you know, we, we've got so many dozens, literally, still queued up. So I apologize. We can't get to everybody. Um, this is a big topic. Um, I will kind of say in advance that we're going to do an ask the expert um, your questions next week on this topic because we anticipated there would be a big uh, a big uh, overflow of questions. Uh, so if you would like to attend next week, um, I think that that's gone out to folks. Uh, Olivia can give you more information about that. There's a link right there that came up in the chat. But um, oh, Olivia, maybe we've got time for one or two, possibly more. Yeah, we could do a couple more. 
This next one is from Beatrice, and she's asking, how would you transform an MDD CER to an MDR CER when literature search was quite nonspecific? Um, well, Beatrice, you conduct a specific systematic clinical uh, uh, literature review for your MDR CER. So whenever you whenever you move even from even from MDR to MDR, in other words, it's an annual update, or especially if you're moving from an MDD CER and you are transforming it, as you say, which is a good word, over to a CER for MDR, um, you you're starting from scratch essentially. So you uh, your literature search must be very specific. It must be systematic, and that must be rigorously documented in the CER. We've done webinars just about the systematic literature review, many of them actually, because and I'll just leave you with this thought: if the notified body sees the data that you derive from the uh, clinical literature on your subject device, from published clinical literature, and they do not have faith or visibility or clarity on the methodological approach you used every step of the way, they will then doubt your data. So that's, and we all know what that means. If they doubt your data, they'll doubt everything. Everything falls after that because if they don't believe your data and how you got it, then they're not gonna consider it in any of your conclusions. So this is probably one of the most important things. I know I say there's lots of important things about a CER, but do not scrimp on your uh, systematic literature review methodology. It must be scupulously documented according to MDR standards. One okay. more. Okay. Just one more. One, one more. more. All yeah. right. Last question. How to create acceptance criteria when there are no published data on comparator devices? What would you say about this, Lori? Um, published data on comparator devices. All right, on your competitors. Um, and I'm taking comparator there to mean competitor. It's not like a, an equi equivalence device, um, which is not the same thing. So uh, as long as we're clear on our terms there, um, the only place you have left to go is standards. As we talked about earlier, guidelines and standards is that you might be able to pull some data from there to establish acceptance criteria. So that is my, that's my hint about that. I think we're, we really are done now. I um, look forward to you know, seeing you again next week if you can make it for uh, further questions. Olivia, any last thoughts? Thank you again, Lori, for your presentation today and for everyone attending and for all your wonderful questions. We hope this presentation brought you more clarity on the clinical evaluation report critical concepts and how to approach this report. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. We hope to see you next time. Thank you, everyone.